First, let me apologize in the name of Mother Nature, because we were supposed to be here last Thursday, Tuesday, right? And uh, the snowstorm prevented us from being here, but uh, it's always a great pleasure to be here with you guys and to share uh, the teachings of Kardec and of Jesus. Um, we are going to talk about charity, as was requested by uh, the or organizers saying that this is the month that you guys are the oh the year oh I thought it was the month okay <laughs> so it's the whole year more responsibility on the on the lecture so we're going to talk about charity uh, first let's define charity before we go into into analyzing let's see what the dictionary tells us about charity because that's something that when you go outside of spiritism many people when you talk about charity they they will go by the first or the second definition that we find in the dictionary so the first definition is an organization set up to provide help and raise money for those in need so <clears throat> these are organizations it's not the, it's the, the word that defines an organization that provides assistance or the voluntary giving of help, typically in the form of money, to those in need. That's the second definition. And only the third definition, we are going to find what is charity, more or less in, in what we spiritists believe is the full uh, definition of charity, which is kindness and tolerance in judging others. Now, Charity, for those that uh, do not know, comes from the word caritas, that went into French as, I forgot the word in French, charité, which is an old French. And caritas comes from the Latin carus, which is dear. So in the sense, in the true definition of charity, according to the Latin version of the word, is Christian love of one fellows. So you see that, we see that uh, the definition of charity, of giving money, which is the definition that is most spread out there. If you go out there and, and you ask someone that is not a spiritist, that, that there is just someone that is walking the street, and you ask them, what is your definition of charity? They will say probably to help others by providing material assistance. And uh, we're going to analyze here that that is an important part of charity, but that's not all. So let me find out where we move forward, back and forth here. Yeah. So the three definitions of charity that we are going to analyze today is beneficial charity, benevolent charity and spiritual charity. Spiritual charity is the charity that we spiritists need to focus. It's the charity that we practice inside the spiritist centers and outside the spiritist centers. So we are mostly going to focus on that because I think that's the important part for us spiritists. But all three aspects of charity are very important. So. To start, what is benef benef beneficent charity? It's really social assistance. It's to provide material assistance to others, uh, working to help others. This work can be paid work or can be uh, voluntary work, but it is a work directed at providing help to those in need. So it is, we can call it material charity. And because it's material, it's related to the financial possibilities of the person who wants to donate. For you to give something of matter, material, you need to have it. If you don't have it, you cannot give it. So. It is limited by the ability of one to dispossess of what they have. Now, 
it is independent of any particular belief. You can believe in anything. You just need to help to uh, help others. Um, something I was going to say in the, in the beginning. Why do we need to talk about charity? Because charity is not a part of who we are still. We are not, charity doesn't come naturally to us. At our stage of evolution, we are still struggling to practice charity. The more evolved spirits, charity is a part of who they are. They don't need to make an effort to practice charity. It's that famous story of Mother Teresa that many of you have heard before that uh, this uh, journalist was interviewing her in, uh, in the place that she worked and suddenly she stood up and ran out of the place and he was surprised and he just followed her and she was in Calcutta, she moved around the, the streets and then she ended in a pile of garbage and then she starts removing the garbage and grabs someone, an old man, that was dying. And you can imagine the state of the guy, uh, decom almost decomposing in the middle of the garbage and uh, taking his last breaths. And she embraces him, put him in her arms, and stays with him until he dies. It doesn't last long. The journalist looks at her and say, I couldn't do this even for one million dollars. And uh, she answered to him, neither could I, only for love. That's when charity is a part of you. You don't look for any recompense. You don't look for any reward. It's just who you are. You are doing it because that's part of who you, you are. Now, I know we're not there. We are far from there. So that's why we're here trying to study, try to understand, and try to make an effort to make charity become a part of our daily lives, of, our, of what we do with our lives. So going back to the material charity. This guy, Paul Hawken, he spent the last decade researching organizations dedicated to restoring the environmental and fostering so social just, justice. What did he find? The world, the world of nonprofits. What are nonprofit organizations? Are organizations that are dedicated to assist others in any area of necessity of uh, of needs. They are nonprofit, of course. They their target is to help and assistance, assist others. Now. Of course, they need resources, they need funding, and those many that work for nonprofits are paid uh, employees because we all need to make a living, right? And for an organization to work efficiently, professionally, you need to have workers that are paid. Otherwise, uh, we that all that work in spirit centers know how is the struggle, right? To have volunteers dedicated to the work. We have many volunteers that come and go, but those that uh, stay are few and precious, but we'll get back there, there later. So, this is something that you probably don't know. It's the largest movement on Earth. And a movement that has no name, no leader, no location. It's just an independent movement. It works because there are many out there that want to help others. Now, when we, did, we study spiritism and many times we, we get to the part that uh, we are always evolving, the world is always moving forward, and people ask, how come we are always moving forward? You look around, you only see these wars, these graces, and other people around us that uh, we don't understand why we are moving forward. Well, this is a proof that we are moving forward. 50 years ago, this didn't exist. Nonprofit organizations are something very recent. And do uh, you have any idea how many profit organizations are around? There are 1.5 million in the United States alone. 
There are more than 3 million in the world. You know the second country after the United States that uh, has the largest number of non-profit organizations? India. India. Mother Teresa was there because India has a lot of needs and there is a lot of people that uh, understand the necessity and that's why they have I think more than one million non-profit organizations in India. So this is also involves schools, NGOs, and companies, even companies, for-profit companies, but that place social and environmental worries uh, on top of their goals, they can be called um, charitable organizations in a sense. And the largest companies in the world will practice a lot of charity. Uh, if you look at Mr. Gates, Bill Gates, he donated all of his fortune to charity after he dies. Uh, Warren Buffett, he left very little to his children and most of his fortune to charity. These are the two of the richest guys in the world. So we need them also. It's important to have those billionaires that are worried about the world, are worried about how we are going to move forward and how we can help each other. So, as he says in his book, the living world is not out there somewhere, but in your heart. We have tens of thousands of abandoned homes without people and tens of thousands of abandoned people without homes. That's incredible. Uh, we have enough food to feed everyone in the world and there is food left. Why there are people dying of hunger? It's not lack of food, it's lack of efficient distribution. That is our problem. We throw food away instead of working on a more efficient organization on how to distribute food so people wouldn't have to die of hunger. So these organizations, the non-profit organizations, the non-governmental organizations, many of them worry about that and we need those to help us move forward. So as we mentioned a little bit about Mr. Gates and Mr. Warren Buffett, there is a conceptual difference between to get rich and to be rich. They are rich in the full sense. They have enough money, but they are distributing all their money to those in need. They are helping in advancing the world. Uh, Bill Gates is one of the largest donors to scientific uh, research to help several, to find cures for several diseases, uh, to find advancements in technology for companies. Um, so they also help the world that we live when we hear their names. Some of them, not all of the billionaires, unfortunately, are charitable. But um, in spiritism, we know that uh, there is cause and consequence. So whenever, whatever we fail to do in this incarnation, we will find ourselves having to deal with it in the future. How can we help? Well, serve one another. Uh, I just opened this book, Living Spring, when Adilson gave to me, and, um, and I found a phrase in front of me. The best way to get close to God is to help your brother and sister. I think it applies to the concept of charity very well. We all have something to give. We are going to address the second part 
when we really have no resources to give. Because not all of us have money or material possessions to give. Sometimes we live difficult lives, we struggle to survive, and we question ourselves, I really have nothing to give of material. What I have, I can barely survive. So what can I do? How can I help? So we go to the second part, which is benevolent charity. The definition of benevolent charity, if you go to the dictionary, Webster dictionary, is marked by or disposed to doing good. So there you don't need money, you don't need material resources, you just need to be disposed to do good. You just need to want to do good. And also, it's one that any, everyone can exhibit, costs nothing materially. It is within everyone's reach and it is independent of any particular belief system. You don't need to follow any religion or any belief to be charitable in the sense of benevolent charity. Uh, so, as we said before, if, if beneficence is limited, nothing besides will can limit benevolence. What, lack, what we are lacking is this small word here, will. We, want, we need to want to help, to be of assistance to others. So, what are the examples of this type of charity? That's a tough one to, be, to keep quiet and let someone en unenlightened speak, listen to them, right? We are all very aware of uh, keeping our mouths shut when someone that has more knowledge than we speaks, right? We go to the Spiritist Conference and so we listen to these great speakers and uh, we know how to listen to them, right? But uh, when we are there in, with our families and we have someone on the table talking nonsense, charit charitable action is to listen to keep quiet, to try to be patient. Knowing how to turn a deaf ear when a mocking word escapes the mouth accustomed to scorn, when someone uh, speaks ill of others, let's not engage. Let's try to be charitable in the sense of if we cannot remove ourselves from the ambient to listen to them without engaging even mentally on what they're saying because if we mentally engage without saying anything we are already spreading the the words the attacks so the little monkeys there tell us everything we need to do <laughs> not paying any attention to the smear of disdain that greets your entry amongst persons who often wrongly think they are above you. So you go to a place and uh, you feel that uh, everyone there feels superior to you and you feel uncomfortable, uneasy. Nobody is superior to anybody. Let's just uh, be understandable and patient with them because they will find eventually that no one is superior. So, according to the Gospel, according to Spiritism chapter 13, these are meritorious acts, not of humility, but of charity. Because not paying attention to someone else's wrongs portrays moral charity. We are very quick in finding imperfections on others, but we are very lazy on finding imperfections on ourselves. We try to 
ignore our own mistakes, but we quickly find out the mistakes of others and uh, sometimes we point them. So, patience. That's a great act of charity that we can do to ourselves and to others. Normally, I say in our studies, when we study patience, that um, patience, when someone says, I lost my patience, I always say, no, you didn't. You never had it in the first place. Because either you have patience or you don't. If uh, you are losing your patience, it's, it's because you are still trying to learn to be patient, but you don't, still don't have patience. So, how can we exercise our patience? Patience, of course, is a form of charity. Because, as they say here, to give alms to the poor is the easiest of all charity. You, get, you can just give and turn around and move, right? But to be patient, to listen, it's very hard. And to forgive those that God put on our way to test our patience, to be instruments of our suffering, these are a very good exercise of charity, of learning how to be patient. You see how much we are moving away from the alms giving of charity. Um, it is very important, I have said in the beginning, but uh, charity is so much more than that. And we haven't gotten into spiritism yet. We're getting there. Still in the Gospel according to spiritism, uh, Caritas, the spirit Caritas tells us, go, go to meet misfortune, go specially to help hidden miseries, for they are the most heartbreaking. Go, my dear ones, and remember these words of the Savior. Whenever you clothe one of these little ones, remember that you are doing it to me. It's a beautiful passage of the Gospel that we should read as frequently as possible to remind ourselves of our need to be active on doing charity, on helping our brothers and sisters, because we are helping ourselves above all. So, you all know this passage, but uh, it's an important reminder of how Jesus saw charity. The Jews were instructed to give to the temple and to the poor as part of their service to God. We had that widow, that she had so little to be thankful by worldly standards. She had lost her husband, and therefore by the customs of the place and time, she lost her home, her land to grow food, her hope in man-made security. So she really had nothing. She was a beggar, because she didn't have anywhere to go, anywhere to stay, and any source of uh, money. So, be, besides not, ha not having anything, she faced the ridicule of the world. But she went to the temple and she had two very small coins and she threw those two small coins so lightly that they m almost made no noise. And she was in the line, besides the wealthy and important, as they dropped their wealthy offerings because the, G the Jews were, for, uh, were obliged at the time to donate part of their wealth to help the temple and those assisted by the temple. So there was Jesus. He was sitting down opposite the place where the offerings were put and she saw the, the widow that came with the small coins and that's what he told his disciples. This poor widow has put more into the treasure than all of the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the true meaning of charity, giving of what you even do not possess. 
just for you to understand, might, might was worth less than a quadrants, which was the smallest Roman coin. So she gave like two pennies, let's say, in our money. How much is two pennies worth? Nothing. But for her, it was all she had. So that's charity. Now, this uh, scholar, Jewish scholar, Maimonides, in the 12th century, he announced the eight levels of charity, which I find very enlightened. How do we approach charity? And still today, we approach in one of these eight ways. So first is to give sadly, against our will, because everyone else is looking at us, so we are forced to make a charitable action to look good in the eyes of the world. Then to give less than is fitting, but with good humor. So we give what we really don't need, and uh, we don't really care. That's the idea there. Now, to give only when asked, same thing. We're still not comfortable with the idea of helping others. Now, we, become, we begin to enter into the really aspects of charity as our natural impulse, which is to give before being asked, to give so the donor does not know who the recipient is. This is something that is very difficult. People like to give money if, if they know to whom they are giving money to, or material uh, possessions. They want to know that they, it's being used, it's being put to a good use, that they can see the results. To give so the recipient does not know who the donor is. Don't let, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, Jesus told us more than 2,000 years ago. And we're getting to the best parts. To give so that neither the donor nor the recipient knows the identity of the other. So you give anonymously and without knowing to whom you're giving, you give because you want to help. And, of course, to give a loan or a job rather than a gift, so preserving the recipient's self-respect and encouraging self-help. There is this uh, bank in India that uh, start to give loans to those in need, to the very poor, without charging any interest, just to help them um, stand on their feet, start something. They only asked to be paid in installments, very long installments, whatever they gave. Because, of course, that's a loan. By giving a loan, people feel motivated to work, to produce, to pay back. But a loan that has no interest, no, no difficult challenges for, to pay back, uh, it works. They have almost no uh, failures to pay back the loans. All the people that get the loans, they normally pay back. So again, the nonprofit organizations working to their full uh, extent of the needs. So now we arrive at spiritism. We all know that the maxim of spiritism is without charity there is no salvation. Uh, Chico used to say that uh, if the maxim was without spiritism there is no salvation, he would not be a spiritist. You don't need to be spiritist to practice charity. But if you are a spiritist and you don't practice charity, no. We're lacking a lot. We are being pseudo-spiritists. Now, how can we practice spiritist, spiritist uh, charity in a spiritist center? Charity is the soul of spiritism. 
It comprises all the duties of the individual to oneself and to others. That this is the reason why a person cannot be considered a true spiritist if he or she has no charity. If we are a true spiritist, and the true spiritist is the on, only the ones that are trying to be better today than they were at yesterday, nothing else. Practicing charity is part of our effort to become better individuals. It's spiritism's cornerstone. And what is necessary? Jesus told us, love your neighbors as we love ourselves. And the golden rule, you shall love God with all your soul and your neighbor as yourself. Now, charity is practice in thoughts, in words, and in actions. We struggle in all three aspects of it. We don't know how to practice chari charity in thoughts. We know even less how to practice charity in words. And we struggle to practice charity in actions. But the fact that we are aware that we need to practice charity is already a huge step forward. Because many people are there, out there do not practice charity and do not care about it. They think about themselves first, then self second, and third, and then maybe their family fourth. Now, we are here. Because you are all here, you are interested in knowing more about charity, so you already made the first step. We are all here trying to learn how to be charitable, how to put charity in practice in our daily lives. So in a spiritist center, what are the services offered that we can be part of practicing charity? Social assistance, that's something you guys here at ES do it very well, visiting the nursing home every Sunday and uh, helping those. Fraternal assistance counseling, that you also have it here. Talks and regular studies, spiritist education for children and youth, the passes, study and education of mediumship, the mediumship meeting, and gospel at home. These are all activities of the Spiritist Center. So is there charity involved in all of them? Yes, there is. And we're going to look at each one to see how we can uh, practice charity in a spiritist center because in the end here we are all trying to find ways how we can be helpful to our brothers and sisters and uh, inside the spiritist center is our first um, tool to do our charity now remember something very important to have a spiritist center we need to help it survive. So people come to the Spiritist Center and sometimes they forget that their first duty is to help the Spiritist Center survive. So our donations are very important to the Spiritist Center that uh, we attend so they can pay the bills and have a space for us. Now, going further, we know that in a Spiritist Center, we are all working as a team. And this team comprises of the incarnate team and the discarnate team. What connect, connects one to another? Love. The mentors that are here helping and assisting us, the spirit the, the workers of the spiritual side of the Spiritist Center, they are connected to us through love. They want to help us out of love. They know that only through the dedication and love, love in the most ample sense, they can help us and themselves. So we work as a team together. 
Now, on the spiritual side, for them to work, they need good will, good inner dispositions, balanced psychological tendencies. Uh, for those that have read Andrea Luis's books, uh, Andrea Luis talks a lot about the activities that help, that happen in the spiritual side of the spirit center and how important it is for the spiritist workers to be dedicated, to be willing to participate and to understand, of course, what is needed to do from the spiritual side. Um, of course, it depends also on the work of the, the Spirit Center do, does on this side, because there are some associations that, uh, despite calling themselves Spirit Centers, are not really oriented by Spiritist uh, moral and religious teachings. Many use mediumship to attend the immediate interests of their patrons. Uh, for those of us who are from Brazil and um, have visited different spirit centers in Brazil, there are many spirit centers, unfortunately, that are focusing solely on mediumship or on uh, spiritual treatment instead of uh, embracing spiritism as a whole. Everything is part of a spirit center, all the works. If you focus only on one aspect, of spiritism, you are going to face challenges and face difficulties. Uh, we know that there are many people that come to Spirit Center and the first question is, how can you help me? That's why they're coming, they need help. But the help has to be in the global sense of a Spirit Center. The first assistance, spiritual, mental, studies, works, everything comes together. The Spirit Center has to have the whole um, range of, work, of services to provide to the newcomers. And uh, I can talk here about this because I know you guys have all the services here, so we, we are in peace with our conscience, with the work that we provide. Now, what about us, the incarnates that come to spirit centers? We need to understand that we are all different, that we have our differences. We have to respect each other, to put together our strengths, to respect our weaknesses, understand each other's weaknesses, and work united with true brotherhood. Because if we start pulling, each one pulls to one side, of course we cannot sustain the work and uh, have a spirit center grow and provide the assistance that it needs. One of the most important and challenging works of a spirit center is the fraternal assistance. Fraternal assistance are, is provided contrary to what many people think, not for the newcomers first and foremost, but for the workers first and foremost. We need to help each other, the workers here. We need to assist each other on our difficulties. Sometimes we lose our focus on our own problems, trying to help others that come here for the first time, that are really passing by. For the Spirit Center to work, we need to help each other, the workers, first and foremost. So always remember that uh, spiritual fraternal assistance, it's a, a service that needs to be provided at the Spirit Center, but first and foremost, to us, the workers. Now, when we are talking with a patient, how does it work? Of course, the, whoever receives the so-called patient or newcomer or um, person in need, you need to understand uh, what, 
what are the conditions, and you need to understand how to address the, the problems. You don't need a, a degree in psychology, that's not the idea, but you need to be human first and understand and listen to their problems with patience, with understanding, and above all, without judgment. When we work, Fred mentioned that uh, I work as a counselor in the mediumship meeting, and uh, we always study in mediumship studies that uh, we need to be able not to judge the sp spirits that come to our uh, meetings because they come with all sorts of issues of what they have done in the past but um, and it's not very challenging you can when we were working with the spirits you can um, teach yourself not to get influenced by what uh, the spirits are telling you but uh, on on a fraternal assistance it's more challenging because you see people coming with problems that you are not ready to deal with that you are not ready to deal with yourself. Sometimes they bring problems that you have yourself and that you have to provide uh, assistance and counseling and comfort to them. But you need to prepare yourself. You need, we need to uh, study to be in peace, on the, especially on that day, to be able to embrace them. Because sometimes they just need to talk. They just need to vent. And if you just listen to them, they, they leave and they say, wow, what a great uh, reception I had there. And you didn't say anything. <laughs> they just needed to say something. And the ambient that uh, the Spirit Center provides will help them balance their thoughts. So, of course, when you are doing the fraternal counsel counseling, the spirits, the mentors are there also assisting and helping. And listening to uh, understanding what's the need of the patients, patient and inspiring us when we are talking to them what to say. Uh, many times I, I'm not an ostensive medium, I have no signs of mediumship, but sometimes I'm talking to, to spirits in the mediumship meeting and after I say something I ask myself, where did this, this kind came from? I have no idea why did I say this? And you see the influence of the spirits. Sometimes you say things that uh, you don't even knew, you knew. Uh, so, you know, they are there to help us. We just need to be open, to be uh, prepared. So, when we have these cases of, of people that come accompanied by obsessors, the spirits, we need to be aware that the spirits, the mentors, are treating the obsessors, are helping them, and are keeping them in our center so they can be treated during our mediumship meetings or other activities of the center. And the counselor, uh, when you are talking to someone and assisting, the recommendation is for them to find balance, to do the gospel at home, to work, trying to help others, to do charity. Um, this is charity. This is a very important aspect of charity. To be help, to be able to help others, to be able, be able to listen, to assist. And that's the service that uh, all spirit centers should provide. Because we come here struggling and uh, with our problems and to sit and study sometimes is not possible. First we need to get rid of this nightmare that is uh, present in our life so we can find a little bit of peace and then start studying. So that's the ER of the Spirit Center, the fraternal counseling, fraternal assistance. And we need workers that are able to use their charitable actions to help those. Now, of course, talks and regular studies, we are um, listening to the one that is here talking, and it is a charitable work, also being patient with the speaker. Um, and 
on the studies, remember, remembering that we are also assisting and helping the spirits that are here trying to learn with us. This is also charity, to help them to understand, to be able to move forward with the teachings that they are receiving in the Spirit Center. Uh, of course, when we have the initial prayer, there are many that uh, are already thinking of the dinner, of the game that they have or they had. It's, it's common. It's distractions. We are all, we have our busy lives. We come here and sometimes it's very difficult to focus, to concentrate. Uh, we have to be charitable with ourselves. But to be aware that we need to try to control this, to try to bring our focus, our attention to the work that is being done here, whatever the work is, try to not to distract ourselves too much from the work here so we can be more productive as a team, as a group with the work that we do. Um, when someone is talking, they are always guided by the spiritual benefactors. Now, you need to prepare yourself. Uh, if anyone wants to learn how to be a speaker or improve themselves, actually we have a, on, 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 on April 15, we have, we have a, a uh, a workshop with Julio Carvalho on uh, how to be a speaker. It's going to be at SGNY, Saturday, April 15, from 4 to 7. You're all invited, okay? If you want to know how to speak in public a little better, even if it's to do the gospel. On, uh, you are asked to do the gospel here on, before a, a meeting. To learn how to speak in public is very important. Uh, so. The mentor is always helping, but if you do not prepare yourselves, they cannot do the work for us, right? If you don't know what you are going to talk about, they cannot force the words into your mouth. Um, that we talk a little bit, what happens during the talk. You know, people are sleeping, thinking about the soccer game, thinking about the, any other thing except what they need to focus. Um, we're talking about charity. Again, it's charity to whom is speaking and charity to ourselves that uh, we are doing. Yeah, it, it's steakhouse. steakhouse, yeah. Meat, yeah, but meat is a, a, a delicate subject in Brazil these days, right? Yes. Um, now, the book of prayers that we have, we put our names to, for those that in need to ha of, of assistance. There are two ways of placing our names there. There are those that come there and write the book, the name, because they don't want any responsibility with it. They, they will help him or her. I don't want to be involved in this. I don't want to make the effort. And those that sincerely want to help, so they will be a part of their assistance, even if they are not aware. Because what happens is the spirits go there, read the name, go to the, to the person who is asking, in this case, this lady that wanted <coughs> to help her son that uh, was struggling because the wife have abandoned him, had abandoned him. And uh, the spirits go, connect to her, and then go to his house to help and assist him. So it's a teamwork. Now, if she wrote the name and move away from the, 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 the book and didn't think about the name, what happens? We're just giving the spirits a lot more work to do because they need to find who this person is, where this person is, and they, do, they need to do all the work by themselves instead of us helping them. So do we have any merit of writing a name down the book if we are not doing anything else? The person will be helped. If they deserve to be helped, they will be helped. Because anyone that deserves to be helped will be helped and assisted. 
So who's missing the opportunity is ourselves. We that wrote the name in the book and missed an opportunity to be charitable, to, be, to practice charity, to assist that person in need. Of course, the education for children and youth is very important. I know you do the work here. Uh, I know you have the, 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 the we, we struggle with this work, right? We have here in, uh, in Manhattan, we, both our centers have lack of children to, to do the work, but we have it. It's there available. And uh, how can we help them? By giving the basics of spiritism, showing good moral behaviors, uh, bring activities, and introduce them to spiritist centers so that they can start being comfortable with the spiritist ideas so in the future it can become a tool to help them to improve their, the quality of their own lives. Uh, it's important to think about the future and uh, we have to have these services at our spiritist centers and it is of course a charity we are doing to the children to our own children and to others. The passes. The pass givers are instruments of uh, the spirits to assist those that are receiving the passes. How is this charity? Whenever we are doing any work that is to assist others, we're doing charity. So, pass givers, they are charitable also. Um, of course, the, uh, how the pass works, you all know, but um, just by being volunteer to do the passes, it's a, a, another uh, work that can be done in the Spirit Center that involves charity, involves assisting others, uh, involve helping those in need. You see, when the path is given, the spirit is always there, present, uh, assisting, and the spirits know what we need. Uh, one thing that I like to say always is that uh, the intermediary is just the intermediary. The spirits know what we need. There is never, uh, you're never going to sit in a wrong chair. Even if the path giver is not in, in, on their best day, the spirits will find a way to, to get what you need. Uh, there is a very funny um, sketch from that group in Brazil uh, about passes, right? The lady making all the... <laughs> the, uh, uh, moves and gestures and, uh, and the spirit in the end just remove her and takes care of the patient itself. So, you know, the, you are always going to receive what you need, you, what you deserve. Uh, but if we can help the spirits, why not, right? Uh, the water that uh, we take after, of course, is always magnetized by the spirits. And these are the work that the spirits are doing without uh, our participation. On the mediumship studies and practice, the mediumship meeting is a work of charity. Because what are you doing in the mediumship meeting? The mediumship meeting, the type of mediumship meeting that we do here at our group and here at uh, Inner Enlightenment is to provide assistance to needy spirits, to talk to them, to help them, to uh, guide them to find balance, to find um, consolation, hope. This is pure charity. Now, in order to be part of the mediumship meeting, you need to study, of course. And um, the studies are an important part. And you see from this uh, André Luiz book, which is the domain of mediumship, how the spiritual team works in a mediumship meeting. And you see all connected to each other and connected to the mentors. Uh, if you read the, 
in, at domain of mediumship, you find the explanation for the glasses. Um, so these are all parts of the book, Domain of Mediumship. Struggling spirits that come and are helped and assisted. And of course, you are donating your time to help those in need, either in the physical and the spiritual world. And uh, the most precious thing that we have is our time. So every time you are donating your time to help others, in any form, you are practicing charity. The Gospel at Home. The Gospel at Home helps the spirits, besides helping us at home, helps the spirits in need that are brought to our homes, that are connected to us, or even that are not connected to us, but that are brought to our homes to learn, to listen, to find consolation. So it's very important that uh, we do the gospel at home uh, regularly, same day, same hour, every week, as much as possible, because the spirits are busy and they need us to be um, efficient, so they can be efficient also. And they'll bring the, the spirits in need, and don't worry, they, they won't stay there. They are removed from your home after we finish the gospel. So it is a form of charity also to help those spirits in need, besides helping ourselves and our home, right? Which is great also. So, <clears throat> just to finalize here some thoughts on charity. Many are called to work with Jesus, but few are chosen, because in fact, few of them remain faithful to the work, placing the task before their ego. We always find excuses that uh, to postpone or to avoid doing the work of charity because we have something more important to do. Uh, that's why in the end, very few are the, the, the true workers. But it's important to realize that we are not irreplaceable. The work of good do not need us. We need it. Therefore, if someone decides not to practice charity, not to, or to bury one's talent, there will be always a replacement. The spirit center will continue with or without us. The spirit center does not need us. We need the spirit center. So the work will continue. We need to be to want to be part of it and to dedicate ourselves to it. As Emmanuel said, in the Christian arena, to start is easy, to continue very difficult, and one can only reach the end through sacrifice. We see how many people come full of ideas, full of enthusiasm, uh, arrive at the Spirit Center, and then we ask them to do a work, and they start, and they stop very quickly, and they lose interest, ability, desire, problems come. So it's easy to start. To continue is already a challenge. But to finish, that's for very few. Don't forget that the essential and exclusive goal of Spiritism is your improvement. Uh, and I also want to remind the phrase of Emmanuel that uh, said, the best, um, I'm going to get this, because <laughs> I want to say in the right way, because it's Emmanuel. The greatest charity one can do is to disseminate spirit. That's from Emmanuel. So, you probably know this case of Chico Xavier, right? Just to finish, that uh, he was late to work and a woman kept calling him and uh, he pretended not to hear her. And then Emmanuel appeared in front of him and said, 
where do you think you're going? And Chico says, I'm late for work. And then Emmanuel says, well, if you're already late, stop and see what the woman wants. So the woman said to Chico, she just had left uh, Chico's uh, session and Chico re prescribed uh, a medicine. And she said, I have no money to buy the medicine prescribed to me by the mentor. So Emmanuel and Chico said, Emmanuel is telling me that you should then cut the prescription in tiny pieces and take one twice daily with a glass of water because the assistance comes from the spirits whenever we need. Uh, and then Emmanuel asked Chico, Chico to look back and rays of luminous colors were reaching him from the woman's gratitude. So sometimes we are too busy to stop, to listen, to help, and uh, that's the opportunity we are missing, to be blessed and to be assisted. So, true charity is not only displayed in beneficence, but in the gathering of all the qualities of the heart, in goodness and benevolence towards one neighbor. So, I hope I was able to bring the notions of charity according to Spiritism, why charity is so important in our lives, and why we should reflect on how much we are willing to do charity first and foremost for ourselves, for our uh, spiritual evolution. Because going back to what Kardec said to us, without charity there is no salvation. Thank you.